So, this surprisingly enough is a pretty big topic, but um, um, Catherine was kind enough to edit my lecture uh, a little bit. But uh, objectives, you should be able to differentiate and identify anti-uveitis using definitions and nomenclature. I'm assuming all of you have read, read the Sun criteria. Uh, uh, so the Sun Working Group was a bunch of uveitis nerds who got together and decided uh, what specifically uh, you know, uh, com comprises inflammation, how to grade inflammation, and to grade it in a standardized fashion. There's two ways you do, two reasons you do this. Number one is to make sure that every single patient that you see, if somebody else was to see that patient later, uh, they'd be able to tell you if the patient is less or more inflamed than when you'd seen them before. And the second thing is if you've ever done a retrospective chart review and seen that, um, uh, you know, notes are not standardized. Uh, it's very, very difficult to conduct uh, retrospective research without some standardization. And uh, the IUSG uh, and the a a a U AUS, they came together and they created the Sun Criteria, and the vast majority of uh, UVA specialists in the world actually use the Sun Criteria, so it's easy to cross-compare uh, across uh, institutions as well. Um, I'd like you to be able to recognize typical signs and symptoms of anterior uveitis, uveitis um, understand the approach to examination, and a little bit about diagnostic uh, modalities and teaching and uh, testing. Um, talk about infectious and non-infectious uh, diseases that can be associated with this, and understand treatment and management. So it's the most common cause of uveitis, uh, three to four. Three, about 75% of all cases with an annual incidence of 8 in 100,000. It's the easiest to manage for the most part, but there, uh, I'll talk about certain complications that make it hard. You can have cataract, glaucoma, CME, band keratopathy, endothelial fail failure, and many pan-uveitis syndromes can actually start as anti-uveitis, including BKH. So, uh, we'll talk about intermediate uveitis in, uh, on Monday, uh, but there's anterior uveitis generally involves inflammation of the iris and the uh, ciliary body. So you can have an iritis component and a uh, cyclitis component, which is why a lot of patients with iris cyclitis actually present sometimes with low pressure. Uh, people can also present with high pressure in the eye when the trabecular meshwork is, uh, is involved. Remember, there's no hard barrier between any of these structures, all comprising the uvea, therefore um, th th therefore, all of these structures can be involved. Um, so, question, if there's CME or papillitis, is it still anterior uveitis, Brad? Yes. That's right. So, uh, vascular reactivity uh, and leakage in conjunction with any intraocular inflammation does not change uh, the kind of inflammation it is. So you can have CME with anterior uveitis, posterior uveitis, intermediate uveitis, and pan uveitis. Similarly with papillitis as well, with severe anterior uveitis, you can have swollen optic nerves. Uh, how about retinal vascular sheathing? Can you have retinal vascular sheathing with, uh, with anterior uveitis? The answer is yes, absolutely you can. You can have just mild vascular reactivity as well, as long as it's peripheral. So here's a 17-year-old kid uh, who was followed by optometry and treated with drops for about six months. I referred in for bilateral anterior uveitis. So is this really anterior uveitis, Catherine? What do you see on the ultrasound? So it is to scale. It's not that I squished the image. The eye is squished. Looks like there is um, thickening of the of the retina. Of the choroid. Of the choroid. Yeah. And uh, and, th and then there's this white cataract and 
evidence of old Zanikia, and that this is actually the length of the eye because I was pressing a little with the ultrasound probe. Should that happen? No. This patient's pressure was zero. Seventy-year-old high school kid treated with anterior VA, four anterior VAs, but never really dilated. So um, this is, as Eric often mentions, Shakur has a lot of soap boxes, and this is one of them. You can't call something anterior uveitis unless you've dilated the patient because you have no idea, right? So this patient actually had VKH, and is now uh, the president of his uh, of the low vision chapter in his college at UC Berkeley. Uh, but he does pretty well. He's a trail runner. Um, he's 2,400. So you can have pain, photophobia. You have to distinguish between photophobia and photosensitivity. Remember, photophobia is kind of a bilateral phenomenon. So if you uh, shine light in the opposite eye, that's, uh, then, then that which is involved, you'll, have, you'll still have pain in the affected eye. So photophobia has to, have, uh, has to involve pain. For sensitivity does not. Uh, certain anterior uveitis are painless, such as GIA, Fuchs, and Dinu. Uh, there's redness, there's reduced vision from the from cataract or medial opacity (CME) and pupillary meiosis from posterior synechia. <coughs> have reduced visual acuity, increased pressure, or decreased pressure, ciliary flush. Um, remember, flare may not always go away. Um, uh, because flare, what, what is flare, Chris? Protein. Yeah, so basically it's incompetent blood vessels in the iris as a result of inflammation, resulting in um, kind of this exudation of protein into the anterior chamber. Um, and flare, uh, regardless of how much you treat, it will, may not go away, which is why Sun uh, does not use it as a measure of, of inflammation. Uh, assess the quality of the cell is pigmented, dusky, refractile, fine versus coarse, uh, fibrin and plasmoid aqueous. So, so what is pl plasmoid aqueous? If you sit there with a sit lamp and watch cells go by, it's not that much fun. Uh, <laughs> but you, you'll see that there's a particular circulation within the anterior chamber. Um, and if it doesn't flow, if the cell is static, it's one of two things. Either you have silicon oil in the anterior chamber, or you have a plasmoid aqueous, which means that it's just it's a thick, proteinaceous uh, fluid. And I've actually done anterior chamber taps on these patients, and it comes out and it's like oil. Um, so if, if you see fibrin or that, then, then that's a bad prognostic sign. That means there's a lot of inflammation. It's kind of a pre-hypopion. So what, what features do you look for in keratic precipitates, Marshall? Uh, how are the characters? Um, and they can be fatty or fine. Yeah. Fatty, yeah. Fatty, fatty ones, granulomatous KPs, or you can have uh, fine stellate ones, which you'd see in herpetic disease or CMV. Uh, distribution, so it's important to know where they are. So remember the normal circulation within the anterior chamber. So you have fluid that comes down and then goes around like this and then uh, kind of circulates that way. If you read anterior chamber dynamics, uh, surprisingly people have written papers on that but, uh, using nanodots. Um, that's what is responsible for what's called Arles Triangle. Arles Triangle is, everybody likes to name something after themselves, right? Uh, but, but Arl, I don't know who he was, but he, uh, there was, there's, a, there's a triangle where you most commonly find the greatest distribution of keratic <coughs> precipitates. Now, if you have, most conventional uveitis will have kind of a lower distribution of keratic precipitates, but what if it's distributed all over? Uh, then then what, are you, what are you thinking of? So there's certain diseases that cause kind of a uh, even distribution of keratic precipitates. Most of them are the herpetic diseases, such as uh, CMB, BZB, and HSV. Fuchs, heterochromic iridocyclitis, which is actually just rubella. 
um, you have this kind of a, a floor to ceiling distribution of chronic precipitates, and you can see that with some other diseases as well. But so, Ariana, name the what, what, what kind of precipitates are these? So, first the distribution is mostly it's inferior pre predominant. Yeah, and they're big. Mm -hmm. They look like bacon grease. Actually, they should call it bacon grease, but they, this is what they call mutton fat precipitates. And they're kind of these greasy, stuck on uh, precipitates, and this implies granulomatous disease, right? Um, and uh, so you'd see this in sarcoidosis. This was actually one of my patients with sarcoid. Um, this is also kind of greasy stuck on, so kind of granulomatous, and you'd think sarcoid or TB or something, but no, this is actually varicella zoster. So varicella zoster can also give you these mutton fat greasy kind of precipitates. Then you have these fine stellate ones. This is a, this is a patient with HSV, and this is a patient with, uh, with HLA-B27 and TUVA. Just notice how it very nicely respects that triangle, right? Whereas these ones, you don't get a good look, but they, this, this one actually didn't. This one doesn't as much just because of the severity of the inflammation. So, Rachel, when can you see a hypopion in anterior uveitis? Which particular diseases are you thinking about? Absolutely. That, that's probably the most common. What other diseases? Even if there's not anterior uveitis, but you see a hypopia. Well, what must you think of immediately when you see a hypopia? Yes, absolutely. So uh, never, never doubt that sometimes that patients can have an, uh, kind of an end of the mitis without having ever had surgery. Endogenous end of the mitis, least in my clinic, is actually fairly common. Uh, globally, it's not. Um, but yeah, you can see a hypopia in, in, in other diseases as well where there's severe enough inflammation. You can even when mismanaged or unmanaged, you can see it with herpetic disease. But conventionally, for you, the purpose of your boards, um, the a hypopion can be seen in Bechet's disease, HLA B27 uh, associated anterior uveitis. Rifibutin toxicity, which is a drug that they used a lot in early uh, for prophylaxis in patients with uh, with, uh, with HIV, infectious endophthalmitis, endogenous versus exogenous. That's the first thing you should ever rule out. So, if a young person who's healthy and not an IV drug abuser comes in with an endogenous endophthalmitis, you can give them a chance with topical steroids first. But if an older person with, uh, say, an indwelling catheter or or who's diabetic or has some form of immunosuppression or likes to shoot up IV meth every once in a while, uh, those, those patients you should probably tap. So iris nodules are monocytes and inflammatory debris. Um, so <coughs> Kepi nodules uh, and Basaka nodules, both of them actually are granulomas. The iris granulomas are kind of like exactly what you'd see in a lung, for instance, with uh, 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 with sarcoidosis or, or tuberculosis, except that they're non caseating. Uh, Kepi nodules kind of peek out from the side, from uh, from the iris rim. The sarco nodules are on the face of the iris, and uh, you can see them in sarcoid, syphilis, TB, leprosy. Uh, actually have a patient with leprosy, uh, Hansen's disease, uh, no relation to our fellow. <laughs> like if, if anybody can think of a syphilis sign and then we'll name it after Eric. It <laughs> 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 will make his day. <laughs> anyway, so Sarcoid syphilis, TB, leprosy, iris and, uh, nodules, and skin findings as well. Think about sarcoidosis. What is the classic rash of sarcoidosis? Starts with the area. That's right. So you see that with, with sarcoidosis. Juvenile xanthogranuloma uh, uh, and neurofibromatosis. Uh, all of these can give you these iris nodules, which aren't actually granulomatous. 
Sneakier <laughs> can be can kind of uh, can, you can have peripheral anterior synechia where you have starts with these little nodules in the trabecular meshwork. This is a patient with sarcoidosis. What's this nodule called? Berlin. That's right, it's a Berlin's nodule. So Berlin's nodules precede the tent shaped PAS that you see in sarcoidosis. Uh, this is a patient with multiple iris nodules, PAS, and posterior synechia, also with sarcoidosis. This kind of pet tent shaped PAS you see, at, this is the precursor to that, then you see these, this, this is kind of characteristic of sarcoidosis here that comes up like that, like a peak. Um, and your posterior synechia can result in uh, uh, pupil seclusion, etc. Um, if you have increased IOP, think about HSV and BZB first up, think about Fuchs. Fuchs, I hate, I hate the for, fact that it's called Fuchs, it's actually just rubella associated anterior uveitis. Names should imply um, etiology. Uh, look for heterochromia, but remember with Fuchs, what percentage of Fuchs uh, is bilateral? 15%. So it's not always Fuchs heterochromic iridocytitis. You can have heterochromic iridocytitis without heterochromia uh, in about 15%. Sarcoidosis, toxoplasma, and BKH can all cause increased IOP. And interestingly, all of these diseases can also give you floor to ceiling keratic precipitates. So remember, all the diseases that cause floor to ceiling keratic precipitates can also cause increased IOP. Why is that? I don't know. All right, so you guys have read about the classification, but let's talk about a, a, a few little things. Um, Catherine provided me with these very advanced animations. Uh, <laughs> so here's a pa first patient. Uh, first occurrence of sudden onset iritis, inflammation resolved after course of topical steroids. What is this? Is it acute, chronic, recurrent? Acute. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> nice. <laughs> Why did you pick salmon? Though? I don't know. It was the it's salmon patch. It, it matches the border. Yeah, it, it's the theme color. I mean, I'm, I'm impressed with the aesthetic, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, so yeah, first ever episode comes in acute iridocyclitis. How do you treat this? You treat this with topical steroids. And if it's really bad, then you think about oral steroids and you think about injectable steroids. So what do you do before you ever inject or give people oral steroids? Make sure That's right. Good job. Which is more than a certain doctor in a certain place, <laughs> a certain distance north from here. Has. But we'll talk about that at M and M. So box number two. Yeah. Okay. So she she later presents four months later, not three, four months later with a similar episode, uh, and has been without symptoms in the interim. Chronic, recurrent, recurrent, Damn it, Brad. No. <laughs> you showed this to me. No, I didn't. Oh, you changed. Oh, so yeah, you just throw her into the bus. <laughs> no, I, no, I'm not throwing her. Okay, I, can, I, can, I can hear the, 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 the wheel. I was wrong. You were wrong, yes. Uh, Brad. So this is recurrent. Recurrent, why? <laughs> Four months. More than three months. No, exactly, more than three months. Okay, so her husband shows up in your clinic after being referred by an optometrist in Rock Springs, Wyoming, and high pain, redness, photophobia, foggy vision for six months despite frequent use of Visine, which works for everything. Um, you initiate appropriate therapy on follow-up. He's quite quiet, his eye, not him. Um, although he's from Wyoming, so one would assume he's also quiet and quiet. Uh, but two months later, he has another there up and he has chronic. chronic. <laughs> right. Well, when will you know it's chronic? So it's been two months. Right? So he has to have recurrent episodes or episodes that are controlled with medication that are controlled or not controlled that span greater than three months. So technically He's still in the acute phase, but if that it was that to last beyond 
two months, then it would be chronic. But for purposes of this lecture, chronic. Elliot. Which disease is always recurrent and alternating? Almost always recurrent and alternating. Each of the between Okay. Which uh, iritis syndromes are most cron cron commonly chronic? Little child. Joint pain. JIA. Yeah, right. So, JIA or sarcoidosis um, is most commonly chronic, right? So, by defining whether a disease is, uh, is chronic or recurrent, you can actually have a hint as to what kind of disease it is. So, JIA will never be symptomatic. JIA will never be acute, um, except for a few exceptions. Whereas HLAB27 uveitis is usually explosive and you know comes in with the tomato eye and all that stuff. So uh, lateral and unilateral bilateral. <coughs> uh, think about infectious entities such as HSV or VCV if it's unilateral, especially if the patient is older. Bilateral, uh, most likely a systemic disease. Bilateral HSV can be seen in. Yeah, no, not really. People with atopic dermatitis. Yeah. So uh, people with atopic dermatitis, because atopic dermatitis and eczema, they're all T-cell dysregulatory diseases, right? Um, so those diseases, you can see bilateral HSV. So a patient with Down syndrome comes in, uh, first thing you look for is the suspicion of eczema, because Downs and eczema are very highly related. Uh, and if the, it does, then bilateral disease which is classic for the HSV, can be bilateral HSV, right? uh, HSV uh, iritis. If it's alternating, if it goes from one eye to another, or if it's explosive, then think about it. Uh, check for the HLAB27 haplotype. So which diseases may present with granulomatous KPs? Shout them out. TV. VCV, HSV as well. And then there's other ones as well, so you can have um, what necrobiotica xanthogranulomatous, <laughs> xanthogranulomatous necrobiotica. Uh, that's a very rare disease. There's, uh, there's only three cases, and one of them's mine. But then uh, non-granulomatous necrobiotic precipitates. Fuchs. Basically everything, right? Fuchs, CMV, HSV, PCV, etc. So. Think about DB or sarcoid, but also think about BCV and syphilis. Syphilis can also present with granulomatous disease. Uh, we talked about this. We talked about this. Floor to ceiling, see chorotic precipitates. This was actually one of my patients with CMV anterior uveitis. And if you look really closely, you can see that some of these little kippies, they're, they're arranged in these little rosettes almost. And that's kind of classic for, uh, uh, for you see it better on the computer. But this is kind of classic for the CMV. Uh, uh, and this is CMV not in an immu immunocompromised patient. This is CMV in an immunocompetent host, unilateral, often hypertensive, resulting in corneal endothelial failure. And, um, and this is kind of this indolent course that doesn't respond well to steroids. What do you treat these guys with? Which antiviral do you use? You could, but that's a lot of, that's IV, right? So you use valgancyclovir, so you can use valcyc. But what's the problem with valcyc? No, so 15% of CMV develops resistance to valcyclovir. <coughs> that's good. But the other thing is also that valgancyclovir can cause aplastic anemia and, lip and kidney failure, which is bad. Um, so. Uh, you can actually, uh, there's other agents you can use as well now. The Tomovir is one that's non-FDA approved for, uh, approved for peripheral CMV but not organ specific CMV. That's a good drug. And then there's uh, CMV specific IgG, uh, Cytogam. So look at, uh, whenever you see a patient that you suspect of, um, you know, a viral iritis, do check the cornea. Before you let anybody put drops in, check corneal sensation. Most patients with HSV or VCV or even CMV will have uh, relative corneal uh, anesthesia. 
and there's also infiltrate. So if you see any corneal infiltrate, think about um, a viral uh, etiology. Think about uh, associated anterior chamber findings, iris, or the angle. We talked about PAS, Berlin's nodules, uh, Busaka or Kepi nodules, iris thinning, always trans illuminate your iris. Think about um, sectoral or diffuse iris trans illumination defect seen in uh, HSV and BZV, respectively, although how, uh, a lot of patients with HSV can have kind of this diffuse iris atrophy as well. Think about the onset, is it explosive? If it's explosive, think about HLAB27, the chest disease, endogenous endophthalmitis. If it's indolent, think about JIA, fuchs, CMV, iritis, and endotheliitis, dinu. Um, if it's acute and recurrent, think about HLAB27, the jets, herpetic can be cyclical, endophthalmitis or blebitis can, can wax and wane, dinu, uh, sarcoidosis, trauma of foreign bodies, and ask if the patient's been grinding metal on metal, because sometimes you can have little copper uh, foreign bodies in the in the anterior chamber. I actually had a patient who had a pet tarantula who would walk over his face at night when he slept. It was a very loving relationship. And uh, we found in this guy's anterior chamber um, uh, tarantula spines, hairs, that had migrated through his cornea into, and you can't take them all out, so you just, you know, just press. <laughs> when in doubt. Does he still have the tarantula? Yeah, he just keeps it in a tarantula. Why does he let it, why, why does he do that? Next to cuddle. He just put some on his face. <laughs> I mean, how else do you cuddle with the tarantula? <laughs> he gets lonely at night. Tarantula. <laughs> Is he from Wyoming? No, no. California. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> chronic anterior uveitis, GIA, fuchs, sarcoidosis, tenue, herpetic, infectious, lens induced. So sometimes you have patients come in, they've had cataract surgery, and there's a little tiny chip of uh, nucleus sitting in the angle. Re happened recently from Zog's patient. He said it was AMD. I said, no, go back and look at the angle. Um, I, I tried to be nice, but uh, Blau's syndrome and idiopathic. Uh, so Blau's syndrome is a, is a granulomatous disease associated with uh, uh, not two mutations in, in children, so it's basically like a juvenile sarcoidosis with cutaneous findings and, and really, really difficult uveitis. So base your history on your symptom complex. So recurrent anterior non granulomatous anterior uveitis, ask about um, back pain. And not just any back pain. Don't say, oh, you know, the patient has back pain after he deadlifts 300 pounds. No, uh, think about specifically inflammatory, um, inflammatory back pain. So inflammatory back pain is how long should it last after you get up in the morning? Greater than 30 minutes. Should it? Uh, also be present after you've been in a, on a, in a, in a car for a long time, yes. So uh, if you wake up with back stiffness and you have to like work it out until about 45 minutes after, that's kind of this inflammatory pattern back pain. And usually it's not associated with radiculitis. Um, so ask about, if you have a hypopion, ask about back pain, mouth and genital sores. What, what are you thinking about? Which is. Chet. Yeah. Eh, Chet. Blue Chet. No, no, no. <laughs> ATM machine. Oh. <laughs> what? That's right. That's an ATM machine. I was really pissed. <laughs> it's, it's like eight, 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 automatic oh, teller yeah, machine. Yeah, machine. It's like pin number. Like or pin number. Yeah. Non red or chai tea or jackass. Chai <laughs> tea. <laughs> 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 So, exposure to <laughs> infectious diseases, HIV, TB risk factors, ask about pets, um, like pet tarantulas. Um, I had a patient with uh, subretinal track marks and this thing that was moving around. He had a uh, pet raccoon. And pet raccoons can carry dog tapeworms, the best of answers. So, uh, and cylostoma. And so we found these little worm crawling around behind his eyes. So if you have a pet raccoon, 
don't. Um, <laughs> and then travel. So travel, I've had uh, patients, uh, missionaries who come back with uh, with uh, interstitial keratitis and anterior uveitis. Think about uh, Oncocerca. So uh, river blindness can actually cause anterior uveitis in some patients. Uh, other patients with uh, tuberculosis. Um, I have a, a, a patient who's a nurse and she travels to the back of the Philippines every year to work in a TB clinic for two months and so she has TB. Uh, I have another patient who travels back to Indonesia every year and she has uh, anterior uveitis, interstitial keratitis, anterior chamber, uh, sorry, uh, thickened corneal nerves. What do you think she has? It's an unfair question. She has leprosy. So uh, Hansen's disease. Hansen. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. So always remember that. Just think of her. Think of her. Uh, ask about lower back pain, oral genital ulcers, which you see in the chats. Yeah. Uh, skin lesions, which you'd see in many things, uh, we'll, we'll talk about them. Arthritis, gastrointestinal symptoms, medication use, what's the latest one? Um, we love to treat patients with uh, walking pneumonia with this. Uh, Avalox. So Avalox or moxifloxacin can actually cause a bilateral, very herpetic looking anterior uveitis with iris atrophy. So uh, grade the inflammation for reasons that previously mentioned, look at the cornea, check sensation, look at the conjunctiva. If you have sarcoid with conjunctival nodules, and if you biopsy those nodules, you, you have a chance of about 60% of finding nodules. If you just do a blind conjunctival biopsy, then you have about a 30% chance, if it is sarcoid. Uh, iris lesions, lens, plaques, or precipitates, think about chronic endophthalmitis, anterior vitreous cells, and dilate all patients. Never should I ever hear from any of you that you didn't dilate your patients, I swear to God. So help me. <laughs> OCT, fun, uh, fluorescein angiography, rule out any posterior uveitis, fundus autofluorescence. I've had a lot of patients with syphilis who presented with an anterior uveitis, but you did a fundus autofluorescence and you found placoid macular changes. So, so what is that? That's a? <laughs> So, yes, yeah, tertiary syphilis, but it, what kind of uveitis is it? It's a posterior uveitis. It happens to have anterior chamber cell. ICG as well. So, I generally start with CBC, CFP, FDA, VS, RPR. So, do a direct and indirect uh, treponemal test. Um, TB testing can be indicated, although there's a really interesting article by Tim Rosenbaum, 1986, talking about uh, kind of a Bayesian approach to TB testing in uveitis. Turns out that you know if you do it in an endemic area, sure it's useful, but if you do it in a non-endemic area, then you may end up with more false positives than, false, than, than true positives. Chest x-ray is useful for TB and, um, and sarcoidosis. Uh, ACE, lysozyme, and volumetric chest CT only if features are suggestive of sarcoidosis. So would you do ACE in a child? No. Why? Kids have high ACE. They always have high ACE. Uh, would you do ACE in a 60-year-old hypertensive? What would you ask for first? Yeah, so all ACE uh, testing is based on ACE activity. So if you have somebody who has, is on lisinopril, then their ACE is going to be low. So don't check ACE. Uh, and even if you do, in the presence of a low suspicion, uh, check ACE, well, if it's positive, it means nothing. If it's negative, it means nothing. <laughs> it's only got a 60% sensitivity and specificity and a positive predictive value in the 50s. So not a great test, it's like a coin toss. Um, HIV, if you have risk factors, uh, I don't test all patients for HIV, and pre-immunosuppressive testing. So if you're going to put a patient on immunosuppression, check hepatitis B, hepatitis C, so the CDC recommends Hep B surface antigen, Hep B surface antibody, and Hep B core antigen. So those three. And for hepatitis C testing, check for uh, uh, the, there's an immunohistochemical uh, test, sorry, ELISA-based test uh, uh, for Hep C, but the definitive test is the 
looking for uh, uh, um, basically quantitative PCR. Um, so kind of a screening and a confirmatory test. So check those because if you immunosuppress somebody with viral hepatitis, you will kill them. They often go fulminant. Uh, similarly, uh, check for tuberculosis because if you if you're not going to if you're going to put somebody with TB on a biologic, they'll end up with miliary or disseminated TB or TB meningitis, and that's that's a bad look. So, <clears throat> what would you check if there's recurrent alternating non-granulomatous uveitis? Very good. This is my animation. Uh, <laughs> so, also spine and sacroiliac uh, uh, X-rays in a room console, useful. Um, what if you have hypertensive uveitis or stellate floor to ceiling KPs and a corneal infiltrate? Just be easy. Yeah, how do you check for that? AC tap, right. Is uh, blood IgG, IgM useful? No. No, because everybody's had uh, uh, varicella zoster, and about 70% of the population is zero positive for HSV. So it makes no sense. It is useful to rule out the disease because if you have a child with, who's negative in it, uh, with, for HSV, BCV, um, then yeah, sure, that means they've never been exposed, therefore they don't have herpetic disease. But if you have an HIV positive patient or an otherwise immunosuppressed patient, you check them for H H HSV, IgG, IgM, that means nothing, right? Because they won't have the antibodies. Um, so granulomatous keratic precipitates, what would you check? Sarcoid TB leprosy. Yeah, so you especially emphasize TB and sarcoid testing. And in those patients, I'll often, you know, go straight to a CT scan. Because if it's a negative chest x-ray, uh, only very few patients actually have uh, like bat wing uh, hyalur adenopathy. Uh, more patients are, are likely to get, uh, you know, have findings on chest CT. Young, female, indolent, bilateral, <coughs> like a urine beta 2 a microglobulin, think about dinu, and a hypopia. Consider blood culture, AC type of culture, bacterial fungal PCR. But, uh, it's just disease, so there's only the Asian phenotype that is positive for the HLA B51 and B5 haplotypes, so it's actually not a very good test. Uh, other European phenotypes of, uh, of HS disease are not um, positive for those haplotypes. So it's, it's not as good as HLA-B27 or HLA-A29 for birdshot. So young with joint pain, check an ANA, rheumatoid factor, HLA-B27 in room console, looking for what? Yeah. Right. Uh, history of hematochesia, mel melanoma, chronic or recurrent diarrhea, Stand for a GI console, look for um, or ulcerative colitis. Yeah, what? Do they come to your clinic? Do they come to you? It's usually Gene Javen who goes to um, Great Lens. You come in for a red eye, you come out with a colonoscopy. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. Um, Urethritis and arthritis, what do you think about? Reactive arthritis. Reactive arthritis, previously known as Reiter syndrome. Reiter was a Nazi. Um, <laughs> HLAB 27. Salmon color, skin plaques, arthritis, and fingernail pitting. Psoriatic. Psoriatic arthritis, right? So, is generally psoriasis does not, with, in the absence of uh, joint pain, does not have iritis, but psoriatic arthritis certainly does. Derm referral, HLAB 27 as well. So, these patients are often HLAB 27 positive. Sexual risk factors, history of IV drug abuse. Basically, the gamut of things. I mean, you could check for anything, but HIV is important. There is no utility in ordering any of the following ANA, even though the Will's manual written by the esteemed Dr. Calvo says that you should check ANA for anterior UBI, just don't, unless you're looking for JIA. There's no other reason. And the only reason you look for it in JIA is for risk stratification. Rubidoid factor, useless. All these SSA, SSB ones, not useful. HSV, VZV titers, except for when you're trying to rule out disease. Uh, Epstein Barr virus, is, even, is even it, if it is positive, who cares? Yeah? Isn't RF negative in JIA? RF can be negative in JIA, 
uh, but you can, you do have a subset of J in males in particular, uh, where you have this systemic onset, Stills disease, kind of, uh, where, where you have a positive RF. Okay. But RF is what? RF is basically anti-IgG, IgG, right? Yeah. So, um, which is why our rheumatoid arthritis is an immune complex mediated disease, <coughs> for the most part. So acute recurrent anti-VVIS, we'll go through this really quickly, I, don't, I know we don't have much time. Uh, HLV27, younger male, 90%, it's explosive recurrent, <coughs> um, alternating anterior, the best predictor of which eye is going to be involved next is which I was involved last. Uh, associations with ankylosing spondylitis, reactive arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, psoriatic arthritis, and Whipple's disease. Um, HLA-B27 is positive in 7 to 11 percent of the population, so interpret that with caution. Um, so if you're at MNM this next week, then we'll talk about that. Ask about inflammatory pa patterns of axial arthritis. Think about rheumatology, referral to SI joint films. When you have recurrent alternating non-granulomatous anterior uveitis plus HLA-B27 positivity, <coughs> There's a 20 to 30 percent chance of AS or other seronegative spondyloarthropathies. If you have the iritis plus HLA-B27 positive plus back stiffness, you have a 60 percent chance of developing AS. So you know it's pretty common. Let's skip that. Uh, anterior uveitis in 25 percent of patients with AS. Um, this is what it used to be before we had biologics. You used to have this kind of foreshortening of the spine with ankylosis or, and this is actually one of my patients who has had AS since the 1960s and uh, talks to you like this and it turns out it's, it's terrible but uh, he's also got steroid associated osteoporosis and pathological fractures. We've come a long way. So Reactive arthritis, we already talked about this, it's poly or oligoarthritis. You can have uveitis and conjunctivitis. Can't see, can't pee, can't climb a tree. Just remember that, the triad. Uh, there's an infectious trigger, it's often Shigella, Yersinia, Campylobacter, but it can <coughs> also be certain medications. Indomethacin can cause reactive arthritis. What's this rash? It's a great word. It's a hard word. It's called Keratoderma blenerragicum. It's a desquamating splinter or, uh, or, or, or a palmer rash associated with which disease? Reactive arthritis. So, but if you saw this and it was scaly and somebody with a high risk of with high risk sexual activity or yeah, so syphilis can also cause this, but. The, the main thing is that you have these kind of blisters here, so that makes it uh, KB, but in syphilis you have this erythematous but desquamating without blisters rash in the palms of the soles. So I won't go into this, but uh, I'll give you guys the lectures if you want the statistics and stuff. Uh, psoriatic arthritis, systemic findings, HLA-B27 positivity in 50%, uveitis develops in 25%. So you have skin and nail, nail pitting, you have sauces digits and ankylosis uh, where you have like lysis of the nails. So this is a patient with psoriatic arthritis. You can see that they've started to lose their fingernails, that there's pitting of the, uh, uh, of the fingernails, there's this deformity, DAB, MCP mostly. Um, and also kind of, also has this swan neck deformity that you see in rheumatoid arthritis. And this is psoriatic arthritis. And of course you look for these salmon colored uh, uh, skin lesions. So Bob Murthy is one of the only retina physicians I know who takes pictures of skin. <laughs> so inflammatory bowel disease, 20% of IBD have sacroiliitis, 60% are HLAB27 positive, iridocyclitis in 12%. You can have uveitis, scleritis, episcleritis, optic neuritis, uh, and all of these other things. Tenue is most common in females. Uh, it has increased urine beta to microglobulin. You can end up with renal failure, which is often asymptomatic. Patients do very well on steroids and very well on anti-metabolites and cyclosporin. 
It's also associated with a high anchor and rheumatoid factor and hyper hypocomplementemia. It's most likely chronic, um, and it's usually young females, but young males can get it too. Boston Schlossman syndrome is not really Boston Schlossman syndrome. The majority of patients with Boston Schlossman syndrome actually have CMV positivity in the anterior chamber, uh, most likely herpetic, and their inflammatory cells in the trabecular meshwork is most likely unilateral. It's better not to name things. Uh, I don't know who Boston and Schlossman were, but you know it's better to just call them recurrent uh, herpetic, hypertensive anterior uveitis. Therefore, you'll treat them with the appropriate things. Right. Herpetic, we talked about extensively, but uh, remember floor to ceiling keratic precipitates, most, uh, most likely PCV ophthalmicus, but you can have HSV keratitis resulting in this 10%. Uh, you can have HSV uveitis in the absence of uh, corneal findings as well, often hypertensive. You can get keratin uveitis where you have corneal infiltrates, and, uh, and dendrites with anterior chamber cell, you can still treat these with steroids, despite what HEAD says. But if for your boards, if you have epithelial disease, don't treat with, if you have a dendrite, don't treat with steroids, but in practice, steroids actually work really well. Decrease corneal sensation, uh, and what you see here, the sector iris atrophy, if you're transilluminated, it you'd see. And I think, uh, Mike, we saw a patient together, right? So, we won't get into this. There's UVA's glaucoma hyphema syndrome, something else you should read about, but often because of anterior chamber uh, lenses. Or you can see it now with sulcus lenses, with iris sutured lenses, and you have uh, high intraocular pressure from trabeculitis and from the accumulation of junk in the DM, uh, uh, kind of high eye pressure, etc. cetera. The, the definitive treatment is to remove the lens, but you can sometimes treat them with chronic steroids. There's a whole bunch of drugs that can cause anterior uveitis, but the ones to remember are um, moxifloxacin and rifabutin uh, for MAI prophylaxis, um, but there's a whole, a whole host of others. So what is this? Child? Yeah, so, okay, but look at, the one thing that you should look at is, look at the conjunctiva. White and, and, and yet you have all this band gear top of the posterior and you can a white cataract and the, the ship has sailed. So any patient with JA needs to be screened. It's the most common cause of childhood uveitis. And which patient is the most at risk of developing uveitis in JA? RF negative. RF negative, ANA positive, young female, early onset, and what how many joints? Not many. So oligoarthritis, three or less joints. <coughs> so that incidence is the highest. So if we're JIA to ANA, RF, ESR, CRP, CBC, and an HLAB 27, um, other syndrome, sarcoidosis. So this is a patient with iris nodules, keratic precipitates, and this is sarcoidosis. It's a multi system inflammatory disease where you can have, a, uh, it can be, have effects of the lungs, the heart. So remember about 15% of juvenile sarcoidosis has cardiac dysrhythmias. Always get an EKG if you have a patient with sarcoidosis, particularly the young. You have liver involvement, kidney involvement, eye involvement, uh, CNS involvement. Um, you can see granulomatous keratic precipitates and iris nodules. There are many signs that are suggestive of uh, sarcoid, such as uh, iris nodules, uh, trabecular meshwork nodules, Berlin's nodules, tension BAS, snowball opacities, macroaneurysms associated with periphlebitis. This is 100% specific, but very, not very sensitive because it's rare. This is a optic nerve granuloma. These kind of punched out laser looking spots. This uh, candle wax dripping like vasculite periphlebitis, French word phrase is tache de bouger but it basically means candle wax drippings. You see central retinal vein obstruction in the, in the presence of all of this vasculitis. Think about sarcoidosis, this was a bad one. What do you see here? You see it 
What do you call it, right? Heterochromia. So, so yeah, this is the majority of fugues, but you can see the gradual precipitates. If you look at it on my screen, you see kind of these legs between, between the KPs kind of all the studded. It's uh, floor to ceiling studded KPs with fine intercollecting uh, filaments, heterochromia in 85%, indolent, usually with no symptoms. Uh, if you do a paracentesis on these patients, you often get a high FEMA. Uh, 7 to 15% of bilateral, chronic, and 90% don't respond well to steroids associated with rubella. Uh, if a patient has HIV, think about infectious, it's 34% infectious versus only 5% infectious in the routine population. So syphilis is very common, but also toxo and, uh, and herpetic. <laughs> Cataract is the most common cause of vision loss, glaucoma, Always perform gonioscopy. There are four main mechanisms of, anti of glaucoma and anterior uveitis. You can have cicatricial, where there's synechia, there's occlusive, where there's debris, there's trabeculitis, and lastly, you could be causing the glaucoma with steroid response. Uh, Van Keratopathy can be seen in almost all chronic uveitis, particularly in JA-associated uveitis. Corneal decompensation can happen in herpetic, including CMP, HSP. CME is the most common cause of visual impairment in, in uveitis. 47% of one in one study showed um, uh, CME. Remember that uh, it, what you see with, with an FA, you see kind of this petaloid leakage into the, into the macula. Remember that the concordance between FA and OCT is not perfect. There's a 85% concordance, so you can have patients with angiographic CME that don't have true CME, you still have to treat them if they have vision loss. Of course, hypotony is a dreaded complication. It happens when this it's like ciliary body failure. Once you have this, it's usually game over, and then you start doing getting into ocular taxidermy. Just have my OR. Um, we won't get into this. Just remember, Durazol, be careful with Durazol, especially in children. Uh, about 30 to 40 percent of patients, uh, kids under Zog, had a 30 point increase in IOP. So, uh, Durazol sounds like a good idea, but and they've started using it post cataract surgery, just be careful with that drug. In order of IOP elevation, the worst is dexamethasone, especially if you use an ointment. The only, the only saving grace dexamethasone has is a short half life, and Durazol is number two. If there's a family history of glaucoma, then yeah, there's a higher risk. Uh, Jen Thorne published a, a paper in 2000 at, in, a, in ophthalmology where they found that three or less drops over a period of three years is safe. I use two or less, so you can't use that any more than that. Then you have to think about immunosuppression. Periocular corticosteroid uh, injections, we won't get into that, but I'll, I'll give you guys this. Uh, this uh, presentation so you can read through it. So in general, if you have chronic disease and if you keep treating episodically, then you end up with this cumulative damage every time there's a spike. So you have to make sure that you, uh, you consider either steroid implants, which you can use in anterior uveitis, such as uh, uh, red, uh, red asserts, and now Illuvian. Or you can use immunomodulatory therapy with methotrexate, anti metabolized D cell inhibitors, cytosporin, and dacrolimus, and biologics. And the only thing that works in ankylosing spondylitis that prevents joint damage and fusion is so, uh, yep. biologics. So the, uh, and nothing else works. Uh, you can, methotrexate can alleviate the uveitis, but it never fixes the. Uh, the ankylosis. The only thing that prevents spine, spine deformity is uh, a TNF alpha inhibitor so far. There's some evidence that IL 6 inhibitors such as docilizumab may work, but that's untested. But anyway, sorry I went a little over. Any <coughs> questions? 